Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. Pro-calcitonin in emergency department patients with suspected COVID-19, presented by Dr. Charles Cairn. I am Michelle Ashton of Labyrinth, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labyrinth and brought to you by Beer Mario. For more information on our sponsor, please visit www. At .com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click on the send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, Click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Charles Cairns, the Walter H. and Leonor Annenberg Dean of the College of Medicine and Senior Vice President for Medical Affairs at Drexel University. Not enough evidence currently exists that SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, acts any different than any viruses with respect to procalcitonin levels. Vitus Brahms PCT is not cleared for the detection of SARS-CoV-2 and is not indicated to be used as a standalone diagnostic assay and should be used in conjunction with clinical signs and symptoms of infection and other diagnostic evidence. Thank you very much, Michelle. So this talk is being sponsored by Bio Mariu, and I do serve on the boards of Drexel University Physicians, St. Christopher Hospital for Children in Philadelphia, as well as on the National Foundation of Emergency Medicine. The objectives of today's talk are to, one, better understand the host response to bacterial and viral infection, two, understand the rationale for the assessment of procalcitonin in patients with suspected infections, and three, to understand approaches to assessing the host response to infection in patients with suspected COVID-19 in the emergency department, including the potential role of calcitonin. So let's start with a host response to infection. Clearly, the host response is a complex system dynamic. It involves interactions between the pathogen, the immune system, and inflammation. Furthermore, the host response is characterized by distinctive phenotypes, particularly in response to viral versus bacterial infections, and it does vary across individuals. Frankly, it also varies across time. And so what is seen at one point during an infection and host response may change dramatically over time. Some of these responses can be adaptive, some of them can be maladaptive. And then finally, we're going to highlight in particular how the host response differs between bacterial and viral infections. Now, one of the great classification schemes for understanding the intersection between infection and inflammation, or the chemical response in the immune system as part of the host response to infection, was put forward by Roger Bohm back in 1992. In this construct, you have the Venn diagram that intersects infection, in this case yellow, shown with inflammation. And in Roger's construct, this was called uh, Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, or SIRS, and that's shown in red. So inflammation can occur without infection, and there are a number of disease states. In fact, one of the first findings for SIRS was in pancreatitis, but it's also seen in burns and trauma. However, we're very interested on the intersection between infection and inflammation that results in disease states like sepsis, or severe sepsis. So these are typically the states where more severe host responses to infection have occurred. 
So to further highlight then this intersection between infection, inflammation, and time is this graph. Now I took this graph out of the burn literature, but it could also apply to trauma and it could also apply to infection. And the idea is on the vertical axis, we have immune function with those lines above the broad horizontal line being pro-inflammatory and those below the broad line being anti-inflammatory. And then on the horizontal axis, we have hours and days. And so if you start thinking about measures of inflammation, after a burn injury, there's a marked pro-inflammatory response as the cells are injured and a cascade occurs that brings inflammatory elements to it. That's then followed by a period of anti-inflammatory response as the body begins to readapt um, its immune response to these damaged areas. This leads, of course, to susceptibility to infection, which can be catastrophic and deadly in burn patients, as well as trauma patients, and then leads to a recovery phase um, where the immune response, again, it gets more closer to normal, and in the case of burns, can be a challenge if you're doing skin grafting and have rejection of the skin graft due to inflammation. So imagine that you have an intervention that's anti-inflammatory and you give it during the first few hours when the pro-inflammatory time is there. You now have an agent that's directed against the inflammation and you have a shot at showing the difference. But imagine if you give the exact same anti-inflammatory drug during the anti-inflammatory phase. Same patient, same injury, same condition, but now at a different stage of the inflammatory response, it could be catastrophic, leading to infections and potentially untoward events. So understanding the dynamic of the inflammatory response to a host injury or host infection is a key component of understanding the overall impact of infections or injury on people. We've actually looked at this in terms of emergency department patients. And this is done in conjunction uh, with my colleagues at Duke and at Henry Ford and at the University of North Carolina. And what we looked at was to determine at a single point in the emergency department, the T0 on the horizontal axis of this graph, what happens to people's course after infection? Do they go ahead to have an uncomplicated course? Do they have one in which they develop sepsis, severe sepsis, have some organ compromise, but recover? Do they go on to have severe complications of sepsis, including hypotension, cardiovascular collapse consistent with septic shock? Or did they go on to die from sepsis? And understanding the host response at that period of time in these patients was a key challenge of this study We've had numerous publications on it, but I'm going to highlight some key findings. On this slide, the first finding we had is that there are many biochemical differences between sepsis and non-infected inflammation. In other words, we could take that construct that Roger Bone had and determine those people had inflammation without infection versus those people had inflammation with infection. The next key component was to determine could we predict who had sepsis death versus those that survived? And indeed we could. On that single point in time, we could determine those on a trajectory for death versus those towards a trajectory of survival, including those who developed septic shock and severe sepsis. So clearly there was something fundamentally different in the host response among those who survived from those who died. When you start drilling down this uh, perspective, and this was all published in Science Translational Medicine in 2013, we were able to take a look at how well this prediction based on these metabolic and biochemical differences were versus things like organ scores, in this case, Apache or the SOFA scores. And I'm not gonna go into this slide in too much detail, but on the right side, on the upper right part, you see a receiver operating curve, the classic sensitivity on the vertical axis, horizontal axis, one minus specificity, a perfect test will be on that upper left-hand corner 
100% sensitivity, and then zero for the one minus specificity because it's 100% specific. And you really want to have a test that's going to be greater than 0.7 for the area under the curve. And you could see that when you look at organ failure scores, you do have areas under the curve above 0.7. But now I want you to take a look at the curve right below it. This is now going to incorporate the prediction based on this biochemical difference. And at that single point in time, we could get areas under the curve that were remarkable, above 0 0.90. And we get closer and closer to that 100% sensitivity and specificity. And some of the key classifiers were things you're used to, like mean arterial pressure, lactate, which are frequently used in sepsis, but also some pretty novel uh, metabolic uh, measurements. In fact, we looked at not only the metabolites that were novel, but also the proteins. And so this combination of looking at proteomics and metabolomics gives, gives us a system view of the host response. And again, I'm not going to go into this in detail. Uh, the paper was published in Science Translational Medicine, but the key components are you can see these areas in this graph where red and blue highlight, showing the direct interaction between proteins, which cell structures, and metabolites, or the cellular biochemical response uh, to infection and inflammation. And this has led to new pathway identification. But most importantly, it allowed us to distinguish the host response to survival from that of non-survival. Next slide. We furthermore have done studies where we looked at genomic expression. And so these are which genes and which gene products are expressed in response to inflammation. And we saw some pretty dramatic differences. This was then published in Genome Medicine in 2014. On the first column, you see SIRS, or the Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. The second one are sepsis patients who didn't survive. And then the third one on the far right are sepsis survivors. And you could see when you start looking at the genomic expression patterns for each of these patients, and then the different expression is put in blue or red, depending on whether it goes up or down. You can see there's a clear distinction between those who had SIRS and survived without infection, those who had infection and didn't survive in the middle, and those who had infection and survived in red. So clearly, we can characterize a survival response, an inflammatory response to an infection on both proteins, metabolomics, and now genomics. In fact, we've used this classification scheme to publish the difference between these expressions in patients with confirmed viral infections versus bacterial infections. This is um, a data that we presented, another science translational medicine paper now in 2006, where we're able to take a look at those with bacterial infections, viral infections, and probable non-infectious causes. And you begin to realize that the viral components, um, which are in dark triangles, um, excuse me, in the bacterial ones in dark triangles, start to distinguish themselves as being higher and those classifies as bacterial. That's the first column. Those viral components, blue, circles come out in those classified as viral. And then you could see in the healthy group, the third column, that those non-infectious characteristics in the green circles come prominent. And so we begin to be able to classify, again, based on this host response alone, those with bacterial infection, viral infections, and those who are healthy. We also took a look at those with non-infectious causes and could even see some distinction of those. I think most interesting aspect of that is that the healthy profiles were very low. So there is an inherent response of the host beyond just bacterial and viral infections. So when we put these together though clinically, how do we use it? And so this is a paper we recently published in eBiomedicine uh, last year using this classification structure for bacteria, for virus, and then for non-infectious causes. And you can see when you start looking at these profiles, you can really do fairly accurate classification of bacterial infections in this area under a curve approaching 9.9, .9. viral classifiers, again, very high area under the curve, and even classifying those that don't have infectious causes of inflammation. 
So I think the bottom line is, is that you are able to classify patients prospectively based on the host response in terms of genomics, metabolomics, and proteomics. The last component before we switch over specifically to calcitonin is to look at the ability at complex disease of these classifiers. In this case, superimposed bacterial infection on top of a primary viral uh, disease. And using these classifiers, we were able to take a look at patients who had co-infection. And when you started looking at the bacterial, which is in red versus viral components, which are in black, you can see that bacterial infections have a marked pattern, particularly in the red components. Co-infection, we see a distribution between red and black. And then by the time we get to viral infection, it's predominantly black. So there may be value in understanding not just specific bacterial disease, or viral disease, but there may be an opportunity to determine patients who have co-infection with viral and bacterial disease. And clearly, this will become important as we consider COVID-19 patients. So let's move on to procalcitonin. So procalcitonin is a pro-hormone of calcitonin. It can be produced by, produced by numerous cell types and organs after pro-inflammatory stimulation especially those caused by bacterial challenge. In healthy individuals, procalcitonin concentrations are thought to be less than 0.5 nanograms per milliliter. And numerous studies have shown that elevated procalcitonin levels indicate bacterial infection accompanied by a systemic inflammatory reaction. So to illustrate um, the host response uh, that procalcitonin reflects, I think is illustrated in this, this uh, study published by Reinhardt uh, back in 2011 in response to a bacterial endotoxin challenge. Um, and you could see that right after on the, on the horizontal axis, we, we have time and hours. On the vertical axis, we have plasma concentration of various um, uh, markers, uh, including IL-6, IL-10, tumor necrosis factor, TNF, as well as procalcitonin, PCT, and C-reactive protein, CRP. And you can see that after about two hours uh, after injection of endotoxin, you see a marked rise in procalcitonin. It falls off over 48 to 72 hours, and then followed a couple hours, maybe four hours later, by this rise in C-reactive protein. This is evidence of a bacterial host response that is found uh, by procalcitonin. So how does procalcitonin look in this overall schema of viral versus bacterial infection? Well, in our paper in eBiomedicine, we also use procalcitonin as a potential marker for bacterial infection and as its own independent classifier. And we found that procalcitonin did distinguish bacterial infection with a, with a relatively uh, good response and similar to our classifiers with areas uh, under the curve um, that, that are certainly above the 0.7 threshold. So this suggested to us that our classifiers, which we went through, can distinguish bacterial, viral, non-infectious, and that procalcitonin was certainly performing a host response detection characteristic of bacterial infections. Our group has also looked at the use of other biomarkers in sepsis. Now, this is a paper that we published in the Journal of Emergency Medicine back in 2012, looking at procalcitonin in a wide range of emergency department patients uh, with septis, sepsis, and we found that procalcitonin um, performed um, certainly well uh, with an area on the curve of 0.78 um, when measured of sensitivity on the vertical axis and one minus specificity on the horizontal axis. Other things we looked at, by the way, included IL-6, a classic marker of inflammation, a C-reactive protein, and we did use organ uh, dysfunction scores like Apache. So the comment about procalcitonin use in the emergency department would be 
that procalcitonin has been one of the most studied biomarkers in current time. And when I did my PubMed search on procalcitonin, it showed 5,692 references. Admittedly, I didn't search it for human trials. Admittedly, I didn't search it for the UC Emergency Department, but clearly thousands upon thousands of studies on procalcitonin have been performed. In fact, when you look at meta-analyses, there have been four meta-analyses alone over the past year, which have consistently showed the use of antibiotics was significantly reduced with procalcitonin in patients with sepsis or lower respiratory tract infections. There have been two large and important a randomized trials performed in the emergency department, which failed to demonstrate antibiotic reductions with procalcitonin. Um, it's interesting when you look at that, uh, those studies though, um, because they didn't involve as many patients as we might see in clinical practice with that confirmed bacterial infections, rates of pneumonia, and most certainly those requiring ICU care. And so a recent meta-analysis in 2019 looked at mortality of using procalcitonin-guided antibiotics in critically ill patients. And I think this is an important one to focus in on uh, in the age of COVID-19. In this study uh, that was out of the NIH Clinical Center Group, they took a look at um, studies with procalcitonin-guided antibiotic use and compared to in-hospital mortality. In order to be concluded in this meta-analysis, it had to be um, patients uh, with high rates of, of critical illness, uh, and um, they had to have mortality as a significant signal uh, in their uh, cohorts. And when you start looking at this, the overall risk ratio at the bottom here favors the use of procalcitonin in reducing mortality, although I think we'd, we would all agree that the effect is modest. So now we're going to switch over from the host response from procalcitonin as a component of the host response and now look specifically at COVID-19. COVID-19 is caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. There is clearly still a lack of knowledge of several important aspects of SARS-CoV-2 infection, ranging from the pathogen biology to the host response and to treatment options. Therefore, much of what we talk about and put in context for COVID-19 are inferences on the basis of parallel pathophysiological and immunological features of other coronaviruses which have been targeting the lower respiratory tract. But there have been some new insights into the pathobiology. So because there's this challenge, I wanted to review briefly the pathobiology of infections with COVID-19. These figures, which are out of a great review in the Nature Review of Immunology in April 28th, and since we're talking about COVID-19, you're going to see my references are going to become month-specific because the field is moving so quickly. In this schema, you can see that SARS-CoV-2 um, infects cells expressing the surface receptor angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, the ACE2 receptors and also requires the presence of a transmembrane protease serin 2, or Tempris 2. When it's then infected with this combination of the ACE2 receptor and Tempris 2, the cell will undergo pyroptosis, which is inflammatory cell death, and release the damage associated molecular patterns, including things like ATP, nucleic acid, and a ASC olimers. These damage-associated molecular patterns are recognized by neighboring epithelial cells, endothelial cells, and alveolar macrophages, and then this triggers a whole pro-inflammatory cytokine and chemokine response involving things such as IL-6, macrophage inflammatory protein 1-alpha, and other MEB proteins. These proteins then attract monocytes, macrophages, and T cells to the site of the infection. This promotes further inflammation and establishes a pro-inflammatory feedback loop. 
at this point, the immune response, similar to sepsis, can either be classified as dysfunctional and potentially fatal or adaptive and healthy. If you, if you look at the effective or dysfunctional response, this will quickly lead to a further accumulation of these immune cells in the lungs, causing overproduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which through a chemical process will damage the lung infrastructure. In addition, this cytokine storm will move from the lungs, surround uh, other organs, and be disseminated uh, throughout the body, causing multi-organ damage. An important component is that non-neutralizing antibodies produced by B cells may further enhance the infection through antibody-dependent enhancement. This will further cause organ damage. So that's the dysfunctional immune response, the host response, that can lead to some of the catastrophic challenges of SARS-CoV-2 that we've seen in this COVID-19 pandemic, including lung injury and death. On the other hand, the healthy response is one in which virus-specific T cells uh, are attracted to the site of infection. They can then eliminate these cells before the virus spreads. Neutralizing antibodies are produced, which can block viral infection. And together, all these processes can lead to the clearance of the virus and minimal lung damage, resulting in recovery. So what does this mean clinically? Well, this is a, a, a clarification of, of some of the many papers. And again, I'm gonna to get to very month specific data because this is an evolving picture, but these are the patients that we see presenting to hospitals, being admitted to ICU, and frankly, the ones at risk for dying of COVID-19. They predominantly have fever, they have cough, they have fatigue. They have elements of dyspnea, some have anorexia, myalgia, chills, and sore throat. They frequently present with tachycardia, although only 48% in rate, recent large series, but they do present with tachypnea with rates as high as 83%. Radiologically, uh, there are some characteristics that appear to be unique to COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 infection. The first one is that there can be minimal x-ray findings at an early stage, and therefore CT is recommended. And when you look at the chest CT, there'll, these, there'll be these peripherally distributed multifocal ground glass opacities with patchy consolidations. And I'm gonna show you an example of that. And then when you do radio uh, laboratory assessment, you find higher levels of D-dimer, C-reactive protein, and procalcitonin in those with marked disease severity. Another component is lymphopenia with neutrophilia in severe cases, um, along with some characteristic changes in things like lactate dehydrogenase. And I'm gonna focus in on these laboratory findings first. This is an overview of a meta-analysis, which is pretty remarkable given this early stage of the pandemic uh, that appeared in April of, of 2020. I'm gonna highlight the specific areas of the meta-analysis on those patients that are most severe and contrast the findings of severe patients requiring ICU care versus those that are either not hospitalized are not admitted to the ICU. The first one is gonna be this component of lymphocytes, where lymphocyte counts are significantly lower in patients in ICU. And across these studies, you can see they're down to 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0.8% um, lymphocytes, markedly lower than the expected normal lymphocyte distribution. In contrast, the dimers are consistently elevated in these ICU patients across these studies with ranges from 2.4 to 4.1 in those hospitalized in the ICU. LDH is also elevated consistently in these ICU uh, patients in these case series with four levels of 400 and 435 uh, in those admitted to the ICU uh, versus normal ranges. And then finally, procalcitonin is elevated and I um, have three different classifications of the procalcitonin. All is the first, so the overall in the cohort, for example, in the Hong study, 
is 8% of all the patients had elevated procalcitonin. Those in the ICU had 25% of them had elevated procalcitonin. This is greater than 0.5 nanograms per milliliter. And then in the non-ICU patients, 0%. And so that's the way to look across these four studies. And we're going to focus in on procalcitonin specifically a little later in the presentation. But you can see pretty consistently that procalcitonin is elevated at 25% of the ICU patients in Hong study, Wong study at 75%, Tang study at 50%. And then in the largest trial uh, on the far end, it's 14%. And the numbers are significant in that study and that the Fong study had over 1,000 patients. Um, the overall number with elevated uh, BCT was 5%. Those in the ICU was 14%. And those non-ICU patients was 3%. This is the test radiograph and CT images of one of the first patients with SARS-CoV-2. I just want you to focus in on the chest X-ray in the upper left. You see that it's relatively uh, clear uh, lung fields. And frankly, even on the one on the right, it's relatively clear. It's only when you get to the CT scan that you realize that they have these ground glass opacities filling um, the, the lung spaces. And it's pretty consistent and striking it marks a big difference between the chest X-ray appearance and the CT appearance of these patients early in um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Another key component that's reflected in this lung pathology is just been the microvascular alterations. On the upper left is a normal kind of microvasculature of the lung shown on electron microscopy. And immediately on the upper right, you see the destruction in a patient with COVID-19. More remarkable is on the right lower side, on the electron micro, my, microgram, you can see there is a clot inside the microvasculature. And it's difficult to tell on this slide, but this little box off to the right demonstrates the presence of a viral particle at the nidus of the clot inside the micro capillary of the lung. This is a distinctive feature of COVID-19 versus, say, another severe influenza like influenza A, H1N1. In a recent paper in the New England Journal, literally 10 days ago, demonstrated that in patients with COVID-19, there is a distinct change in this ang angiogenesis from those patients with COVID-19 versus prior patients with influenza A. The COVID-19 data are in red, the influenza A data are in blue, and you can see across many different parameters of angiogenesis and characterization of lung pathology that COVID-19 is distinctive from influenza A. There may be a laboratory correlate of this response um, in the form of elevated D-dimers. Um, this is a recent meta-analysis um, that came out of thrombosis uh, uh, in 2020. Uh, this was just published online uh, in May. And it basically showed that for patients who have more severe forms of COVID-19 requiring ICU care, that the um, weighted mean difference between those patients and patients with less severe forms is elevated with a mean difference of over three in D-dimer levels. Um, and I think that this may be an important component um, as we move forward in characterizing the host response of patients with severe COVID-19. So what about procalcitonin in these patients with suspected COVID-19? Most of the data is coming out of China. Most of the data is still evolving. But there have been a number of large series uh, presented um, out of the Chinese uh, experience. The first one was out of multiple Chinese provinces, uh, which was published in February. And it showed that C-reactive protein was elevated in 60% of patients, elevated PCT was found in 5.5% of the patients, and elevated lactate dehydrogenase uh, was elevated in 41% of the patients with severe disease. In the Wuhan experience, 
Non-survivors, as compared to survivors, presented more often with high lactate dehydrogenase, higher procalcitonin, increased serum ferritin, and elevated IL-6. And then Zhejiang University uh, noted that they had good results within the emergency department protocol that included antimicrobial prophylaxis only in patients with long course of disease, repeated fever, repeated, excuse me, repeated fever, and elevated procalcitonin. When you look at what the summary of these studies, and this is now a review that came out in the American Journal of Hematology in 2020 April, you see that there are these consistent findings of increased procalcitonin in more severe patients. I'll just highlight the key results of each of these studies. In the first study, procalcitonin was elevated in 13% of severe cases versus 3.7% in non-severe cases. In the next series, elevated procalcitonin appeared in 25% of ICU cases versus 0% in non-ICU cases. That elevated procalcitonin was present in 75% of ICU cases versus 20% in non-ICU cases. And that elevated procalcitonin had a higher odds ratio of death, uh, with an odds ratio estimated at 13.75. Another study out of Seattle in ICU patients, baseline procalcitonins had a wide range, but ranged from 0.12 up to 9.56 nanograms per milliliter. And finally, that elevated procalcitonin had a higher odds of severe infection in clinical course. In this case, the odds ratio was estimated at 4.76. So I think that it's clear that procalcitonin um, in suspected COVID-19 ED patients is clearly going to be of, of some uh, importance. Overall, the host response differs between those with bacterial and viral infection, and we've seen that in our large cohort studies of looking at metabolomics, proteomics, and gene expression in addition to procalcitonin. It's clear from multiple meta-analyses that procalcitonin can help distinguish bacterial infection and potentially guide antibiotic use, especially in patients who are more severe requiring ICU care and with higher baseline mortality. The current read of all these data on COVID-19 is that procalcitonin is generally low in presentations of patients with non-severe COVID-19, while it appears to be consistently elevated in more severe disease. I still think there are multiple questions about the role of procalcitonin in COVID-19 including in patients in the emergency department with suspected COVID-19. There is a need to better understand the host response to COVID-19 infection, including the induction of host response elements like procalcitonin. We need to better define the role of low procalcitonin in patients with the initial presentation of COVID-19. Third, we need to understand the role of bacterial superinfection in patients with COVID-19. And finally, we need to understand the relationship between this consistently elevated procalcitonin found in these studies and the increased severity of COVID-19 illness. With that, I'm happy to take any questions, um, provide any further comments, but most of all, thank you all for joining us today for this discussion of an important topic of COVID-19, the role of procalcitonin, and how we might take on the challenges of this pandemic together. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their questions. As a reminder, any questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank you, Dr. Cairns, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Biomiru, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This web seminar can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay.
we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.